Morning. 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 Welcome to Superville Church, a one of a kind church on the entire planet. Because at Superville Church, the homeless are the members. And anyone else that walks in that door, they're your guests. Today's lesson is titled, I Want a Do Over. I Want a Do Over. Before we start, let's bow our heads in prayer. Father God, Lord Jesus come to you this morning and I ask you to open our hearts, open our minds, show us in your word, in this Bible, the lessons that you have for us today. I thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ, who came and hung on the cross, that we would have life and have it more abundant. And I pray this all in his name. Amen. Amen. I want to do over. Today we're going to be in the book of Genesis, chapter 27. If you're in your church Bible, it's already been bookmarked to page 40. But if you're in your own Bible, please go to Genesis chapter 27. So today we're talking about do-overs. You might remember as a child, lots of times we ask for do-overs. We'd do something, we'd goof it up, and we'd ask the adults for a do-over. And many times you would get it. I remember one time on the playground we were playing baseball. And the adults were supervising and everything, but we were just kids, and one of the kids struck out. Three strikes, he struck out, and he asked for a duel. He asked if he could do it again. And one of the adults said, sure, no problem. And he got up, and he swung again, and he actually hit the ball, and he got a hit. He got a do-over. But what happens is, as we get older in life, those do-overs become harder to find and harder to get. It's almost as if our hearts harden, people around us, their hearts harden, and they don't want to give us a do-over. And the problem for all of us is, is that we all need them. We all need do-overs. How do we know that, that we all need them? Because we have a Bible that says that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. Not some of us, not a few of us, all of us have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So we know that we need do-overs. Unfortunately, God doesn't give do-overs. The good news is, he does something even better than a duel. He gives you a second chance. So it's God's version of a do-over, but it's a second chance. But the beauty of the second chance that God gives you is that you get it with hindsight. We all look at stuff that we've done in the past and go, wow, what a mistake. I had to do it over again. I do it differently. I wish I had known then what I know now. So hindsight is what you get to take with you when you get that second chance. Now, does everybody get a second chance? The answer is God <coughs> offers everybody a second chance, but not everybody takes God up on that offer. And today we're going to talk about why some people don't take God up on the offer, and then the ones that do, what happens when they get the second chance. So let's start with why don't some people take advantage of the second chance? Because God gives it to every one of us. Many people have told me over the years, they say, Pastor, my sins are too great. I have done too much bad stuff. God's not giving me a second chance. I can't go there. It's not going to happen for me. But I would ask you to think of the gift of the cross. When Christ hung on the cross for your sin, he didn't say for certain sins or for sins that weren't too bad. He hung on the cross for all of your sins. So the blood covers everything. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, uh, early Sunday mornings, when, uh, when I get up and if I first flip on the TV, I'll see those commercials where they're selling cars at dealerships to people with bad credit. And the guy will go, now don't disqualify yourself. If you think you have bad credit or whatever it is, don't disqualify yourself. Call the hotline. Call the 800 number and let us make the decision. Well, it's the same thing with Christ. Don't disqualify yourself by thinking that your sins are too big. Let, let Christ decide if your sins are too big. Let his blood of the cross cover the sins. And you too can not only have the second chance, but you can take advantage of the second chance. Yes, People, when they're thinking about their sins, though, sometimes they get so involved. Sometimes we do things in our lives that we are deeply ashamed of. We know we shouldn't have done, and they just seem to haunt us. And today we're going to talk about a guy in the Bible that was the ultimate sinner. If there was ever a guy that didn't 
deserve a second chance. It's the guy we're going to talk about today. By any standard, this guy does not deserve a second chance. This guy, God should have said, no way, you can't do anything for my kingdom. I'm letting you go. I'm, I'm cutting you off. There's no second chance for you. This guy that we're going to talk about today, he was a liar. He was a deceiver. He was a con artist. He was a phony. He was a cheat. He was an imposter. He was a crook. One of my pastor friends called him a scumbag. This guy was the worst of the worst. What was his name? Jacob. Now, Jacob, when we think of Jacob in the Bible, I don't think of him. I know he did some bad stuff, but I think of Jacob more as the, he was the, not the father of many nations, but from his descendants were the 12 tribes of Israel. And eventually from that descended Joseph, who ended up saving Israel. So when I think of Jacob, normally I think in on better terms than a scumbag, but he was a scumbag. This guy was bad news almost from the get-go. And what makes it worse for Jacob was he came from what we would call royal blood today, a royal bloodline. His grandfather, Jacob's grandfather, was Abraham. Abraham, father of many nations, that was his grandfather. His father was Isaac. We know about Isaac. Isaac was that miracle birth to Abraham and his wife Sarah. Abraham was almost 100 years old when he had Isaac. Sarah was almost 100 herself, and she was barren. And they had this miracle child, Isaac. And then Isaac had Jacob. And he didn't just have Jacob. So here's the backstory to this. You've got Abraham and Sarah. They have Isaac. And then Isaac gets married. And then he has not one child. He has twins. Twins. He had Esau and Jacob. Now we hear a lot more about Jacob in the Bible than Esau. But back then, they had a thing going called a birthright. And what it was was the oldest child in a family would always get the birthright. Now, that wasn't just something that worked. This was a big deal back then. When Papa died in the old days, whoever was the oldest child inherited everything. All the money, all the cattle, all the wealth, all the prestige, all the power that went with it. So back then... If you were the oldest boy, the oldest child, you got the birthright when Papa died. It came to you. So this was a huge thing back then. So in this story, we have these two twins that are born to Isaac and his wife. And the twins, who's going to get the birthright when twins are born? It's whoever comes out of the womb first. And out of the womb first was Esau. He came first. But the Bible tells us that Jacob came right out on his heels, literally out of the womb. The Bible says that he had his hand on the heel of Esau when he came out of the womb second. They came out seconds apart, but Esau nonetheless was the oldest child, and the birthright was his by law. Not just by rule, but by law. So here we have these two boys that are growing up to Isaac, this miracle child himself. Two boys growing up, two twins. But everybody knows Esau is going to get the birthright someday. He's the oldest child by seconds, yes, but he is going to get the birthright. <coughs> so what happens? Papa is starting to get old. I see. His eyesight is gone. He's getting old. He knows his time on the planet is short. So what is he going to do? He's going to give the birthright in word. You have to speak it. In word to Esau. And here we get to chapter 27, and let's see what happens here about this birthright. In chapter 27, it says, When Isaac was old, and his ears, his eyes were so weak that he could no longer see, he called for Esau, his older son, and said to him, My son, the son says, Here I am. Isaac said, I am now an old man, and don't know the day of my death. But he knows it coming soon. He says, Now then, get your equipment your quiver and your bow, and go out to the open country to hunt some wild game for me. Prepare me the kind of tasty food that I like and bring it to me to eat so that I may give it to my, give you my blessing before I die. So this is how they did it back then. They had a feast, and then the blessing was given by the father to the oldest son. So Papa's not dead yet, but he knows his time is coming. So what does Esau do? He's all excited. He's getting the birthright. It's time. He goes out and he's, he's hungry. But now, 
Jacob comes back into the story, and now we see the lying, the deceit, the imposture, the, just everything bad you could say about this guy. The scumbag in him comes out of this point. So Esau's off hunting to get the food, to serve to his father, to get the blessing. What happens? Jacob. Jacob's mom, Rebecca, she comes and she says, your brother's out. Let's steal the blessing. You can get the blessing because your brother's going to get it if he gets back. Let's steal the blessing. And Jacob, what does he do? Does he say, Mom, no, no, no. We can't steal the blessing. That's not right. No. He's, he's talking to his mom about doing this. But he, he's worried about, can they pull it off? He says, you know, if I go in before Papa to get the blessing, if I take some food in there, Pop's going to know right away it's me. He's going to know it's not Esau. So Mom, who's a deceiver herself and a liar and a cheat, Mom says to Jacob, no problem. I'm going to give you some of Esau's clothes. And you wear those in. Papa can't see. He'll feel the clothes. He'll know that it's Esau. He won't know that it's you, Jacob. Jacob, does he finally stand up and say, Mom, this isn't right. I'm not the eldest born. You can't do this. No. He goes along with it. This shows you his character. Not very good, this guy's character. Let alone Mom's character here. But... You can't blame it on mom here. It's not mom's fault. And that's what we do in life all the time. We love to blame it on other people, our sins, our mistakes. It, it was their fault. It's mom's fault. She brought me the idea. I couldn't help myself. I had to say yes. It was mom. Mm -hmm. I think of people that are in car accidents. Over the years that I've been driving, the many years, I can't think of one person that had a car accident that was telling me about it afterwards. I can't think of one person that said to me, Pastor, this one was all on me. It was my mistake. It was my fault. No, they always say there's some excuse. It was their fault. The traffic was this. The light turned this. The people are going too fast. It's never the other person's fault, ever. So here in this story, Jacob, does he get to blame his mother? No. His mother came with the idea of the deceit, but he could have said no at any time along the way. But he didn't say no. This speaks to his character. This guy does not deserve, by any normal means, a second chance. He is going to steal his brother's birthright. And guess what? He does. He wears his brother's clothes. He gets some food that his mother prepares. He goes in before Esau, or before his father, Isaac. Esau remembers out hunting. He doesn't know what's going on. He goes in, and he fools his father. His father can't see. His father feels the clothes. He's suspicious. <laughs> But he thinks it's Esau, and he gives Jacob the blessing. Stolen right from Esau. A couple minutes later, who walks in the door? Esau. Immediately, the jig is up. Immediately, everybody knows what's happening. Isn't that how it works with sin sometimes? Sometimes we do wrong, and we get caught right on the spot. Sometimes it's, it's later down the road that the sins come back upon us. But here, boom, immediately, he's busted. But you know what? You've been thinking it all, and you have to think to himself, yeah, the jig's going to be up. There's no way we can hide this. As soon as Esau gets back, everybody's going to know that I stole the birthright. But he did it anyway. So in addition to being a liar and a cheat and a scumbag, he was pretty stupid. He was stupid to think that he was going to get away with this. So does he get away with it? Mm -mm. The Bible tells us, when we go on to verse 14, it tells us that mom comes back to Jacob, he says, everybody knows the jig is up. You, Jacob, you got to get out of town because your brother Esau is going to kill you. This is how bad it was. Not only was the jig up immediately, mom knew it immediately, and she tells her son, you got to leave town. So this thing is totally falling apart. The family is being totally busted up here with one fell swoop. What was the right thing to do? The right thing for Jacob to do was when his mom came with his deceit, was simply to say, no, no, mom, this isn't right. I'm not going to do it. He's going to get the work right. That's the law, and that's how I'm going to do it. But he doesn't do it. He does everything wrong, and he literally does leave town. He, he runs for his life. Esau, anybody had a right to kill their brother? It was Esau. He just lost his birthright by theft to his brother Jacob. So... Jacob leaves town, and he's gone for a long time. While he's gone, he marries, and eventually he comes back. But he doesn't come back until he does one thing that you have to do to get your second chance. It's 
called repentance. He didn't just go for a long time and let the dust settle and let his brother cool down. He actually, while he was gone in his exile, he repented. Now, don't get caught up in the word repentance. It's a big word. All it means is turn away. Yes, sir. That's it. Turn away from your sin. And that's what Jacob did. He sinned was huge. He sinned his big time. He had to leave town for it and pay the price for his sin, but he turned from his sin. He recognized that he had done wrong, and now he wanted to make peace with his brother. And so he's going to head back. This is years later. He's got a new wife. He's got a family. Now he's going to head back in town. He's gotten his second chance. Esau was gracious and took his brother back, and there was peace in the land. So what's the moral to the story? The moral is there's no do-over here. This wasn't a do-over. This was a second chance. But it was a golden second chance for a man that by any standard did not deserve it. He got a second chance because he repented. He turned away from his sins. He recognized that what he had done was wrong. For us, it's not enough to go to Jesus and say, I know your blood covers my sin. That's not enough. That doesn't get you the second chance. You have to know the blood cover, covers your sins, and you have to repent of what you've done. You have to just turn away from it. The repentance is key. It's like yeast for a baker. You have to have the yeast in for the bread to rise. The blood, by itself, while powerful, isn't enough if you don't do your part. It isn't that. That's how it works with God. He does all the heavy lifting. We know that. But you have to do your part. You have to do something to make this work. So as you look at your own sins, if you look back over your life and what you've done, you don't have to announce to the world what your sins are, but you have to recognize yourself. You have to be able to look in the mirror and you have to say, that was my fault. That, that car accident, whatever it was, that was on me. It could be just between you and God. And you have to say to God, I do repent. I do turn away from that sin. And that's where your second chance comes in. But the beauty of that second chance is, remember, is with hindsight. You've already lived all of that. You've lived the sin just like Jacob did. You know what you did wrong, and you know because you've repented and turned away. You're never going down that road again. So now you are better for it. It's better than just a do-over. It's a second chance with hindsight. So whatever your sin is, whatever you've done, don't disqualify yourself. Don't negate the power of the blood of the cross. That covers all sins, whatever you've done. You have a destiny. God has greatness for you. What it is, I don't know. But you woke up this morning, and that proves that you have a destiny for you. Repent. Turn away from your sins. Turn back to God and get your second chance. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father God, Lord Jesus, we repent of our sins. Come into our hearts. We make you our Lord and Savior. Father God, I pray a hedge of protection over every single person in this church as they go about their day, about their week. I pray you will keep them safe. You will guide them to your heart. I thank you so much for your son, Jesus Christ. And I pray this all in his name. Amen. 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 Amen.